everyone. Welcome to another live stream Fisher Valley podcast. Today I'm joined by Professor Bart Ehrman, and today we'll be discussing his book, Misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. So I want to start off with this. Um, how do scholars discern from the various alleged quotations of Jesus in the New Testament from what Jesus actually said contained within the New Testament, like scholars debate this all the time. What did Jesus actually say? Because I know at the Jesus seminar, they concluded he didn't say most of the things that that were attributed to him. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, it's a very important question. Uh, it's one of it's long been one of the central questions within the study of the New Testament. Um, the difficulty is that we have uh, different reports of his sayings in different gospels. Sometimes the two gospels report the same saying in different ways. Um, and in some gospels, like in the gospel of John, he talks about things completely different from what he talks about in, in the others. So uh, one has to decide what, what did he probably say? Plus we have gospels from outside the New Testament and you have to figure out, well, did he say any of those things? And so what scholars do is they, they basically apply the same criteria they would apply to anybody trying to figure out what they really said. Uh, today, it's a bit easier because you have, uh, you have recordings. <laughs> and so it's a bit hard for a presidential candidate to say, yeah, I didn't say that. <laughs> they have to say, yeah, I said it, but I didn't really mean it, you know, or something like that. But with Jesus, you don't have that. Uh, and so how do you go about deciding? And the criteria you use typically for uh, trying to understand anybody's sayings from the past would be things like, um, do you have do you have sources that are independent one of, of one another who are reporting him saying that thing or similar things to that? You know, do you have a lot of sources that say that's what he said, um, that that didn't get it, get it from each other? And you look at it and you say, you know, well, if, if you do have some things of Jesus that he didn't say, that must mean that somebody put them on his lips, like a later Christian wanted him to say something that he didn't say. And so if you've got a, if you got sayings of Jesus that are perfectly lined up with what Christians wanted him to say, then it's a little bit hard to know whether he said it or not. You see what I mean? But if you but if you get some if Jesus says something that seems to be contrary to what Christians would have wanted them to say, well they didn't make that one up. <laughs> so then you're pretty sure that okay, th those are the ones that he probably said. You also look for things that are um, that make sense in his own historical and cultural context, and so if you've got if you've got sayings of Jesus that uh, really don't fit into early first century Israel, then uh, you know it probably didn't say it. I mean, and sometimes you actually look for anachronisms. For for example, if you were today, if you open up a if you open a, a cookbook that says it was written in uh, you know 1890, and uh, the uh, the recipe tells you to stick something in your microwave, <laughs> you know, okay, yeah, this was not written in 1890. And so you look for that's called an anachronism, where it's in the wrong time <laughs> time period. So that that's the kind of thing you look for: multiple sayings, independently attested. You look, especially just the ones that you're pretty sure he would have said, would be ones that don't go along with what Christians would want to say. You've got to fit in the first century context. Things like that. And would an example of that be something like, um, would an example of a, something that a Christian would not have invented is, is from a, being a saying of Jesus, like sell your clothes and buy swords? Would that be a good example of that? Well, that's a good question. It kind of depends how militarily uh, oriented the particular Christian is. <laughs> you may have some Christian who really believes in the revolution. And so, you know, it's possible that that's put on his lips. But, you know, given the fact that there's so many sayings of his that are more directed in precisely the opposite direction, um, you know, it's, it's so it, it's it's it's, you know, you have to to debate. And th this is why scholars have these controversies, because some people think, well, that's more likely. Other think, well, that's more likely. And so you come up with the Jesus seminar making a list of sayings, most of which Jesus never said. And other scholars say, yeah, actually, I think he did say that one. But the, the two sorts thing, I would say that's probably, I mean, it seems, I don't know, it, it, it seems unlike what Jesus says elsewhere. Maybe followers of Jesus were more revolutionarily minded, um, especially in the early decades i don't know but so that that would be a candidate for something that somebody probably put on his lips i guess and what were 
the last words of Jesus, like what, what is what is most likely what Jesus, what what was most likely his last words? And the reason I put it that way is because like, I mean, as you know, the, the four gospels don't agree with each other about what Jesus supposedly said, but what his last words supposedly were. Yeah. So do we just, are we supposed to just default to what Mark says, or is there additional criteria that's utilized to, to try to sort out which yeah. one of them is authentic? Well, the argument for defaulting to Mark, I guess, would be because it's the earliest account. Um, but it doesn't strike me that that's a very convincing argument, because even though Mark is the earliest, he's still 40 years later being written by somebody who didn't know Jesus and wasn't there and probably didn't know anybody who knew Jesus. So he's writing in a different language and living in a different part of the world. And so I, it, it's not it's not a great source for something like this because because it's very really problematic. I mean, the, the last words of Jesus would be the last things he says on the cross. Well, how many of his followers were there? In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there weren't any. In John, you have uh, Jesus' mother and the beloved disciple, but people have doubted whether that's accurate. Uh, and so there's no way of recording these things. My, my sense is we have no idea what Jesus said at the end. Um, we don't know. And so uh, it's one of these things where you get different, you, the gospels report different things. You're right about that. Um, and it's very important when you're trying to understand this kind of question that you look at each gospel carefully and see what it says and see how it differs from each of the other gospels. And you look to see if there's anything in these sayings uh, that seems to line up carefully with this particular gospel's in other words, you can make a really good case that Mark's cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, fits perfectly well with the agenda otherwise. Um, and you can make a very good case that Luke's final words, uh, into your hands I commit my spirit, <laughs> that those fit perfectly well with Luke's agenda. Uh, and they have, they have different agendas in the portrayal of Jesus. And both of those sayings fit well with their agenda. <laughs> and so um, so I think that makes it calls it into question whether we can trust any of those. And my sense is there was nobody there taking notes. We, we have, I don't think we have any idea what he said. If scholars try to utilize the Gospel of Mark quite often in attempts to reconstruct the historical Jesus since it is the first of the Gospels? Do, are you saying do they? Yeah, they do. I mean, so it, it th this kind of thing goes, this kind of use of Mark goes back to the 19th century. Um, scholars for a long time before the 19th century were pretty convinced that John was an eyewitness account. And so they tended to trust John more. But in the 19th century, especially, scholars started realizing that the ancient Christian testimony was probably right, that John was the final gospel, and that it's not giving a kind of nuts and bolts, what really happened kind of thing, but it's more of a theological understanding of Jesus. So if you think that John is probably the last and maybe the most theologically uh, uh, powerful, and the, the, the most interesting in some ways in terms of its understanding of Jesus, that it's not necessarily historically accurate, you're left with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in the 19th century, scholars then tried to figure out, well, which of those is the earliest? And they, they, they knew that somebody was copying somebody else because they have so many agreements. They're sometimes word for word the same, sentence is the same, and you just can't get that unless somebody's copying someone else. And for a variety of reasons, they end up arguing that Mark was the first gospel and that Matthew and Luke had both used Mark. So it made Mark the earliest gospel. So in the second half of the 19th century, scholar after scholar wrote uh, Lives of Jesus. They'd write a book, you know, The Life of Jesus. And um, in their books, almost always what they would do is they'd use Mark as their basis. And uh, Mark is the one that we can trust the most. And then they would fill out Mark's narrative with their own speculations based on their understanding of things. And, and so Mark was always kind of it. Um, I'd say since uh, for the last 70 years or so, mo almost, almost all scholars agree Mark was the first. Uh, 
Most scholars agree that Mark is probably, by and large, the most reliable. But nobody thinks you can just take Mark's word for it and uh, and say, okay, well, that's it. You know, when they're because Luke and Matthew had their own sources, John had his own sources. They're all based on their sources, and so you can't simply choose your favorite gospel and you know go verse by verse and say this is what happened. And so that's why scholars use these various criteria that I laid out at the beginning of of how you evaluate. You look at all the sayings and all the gospels and evaluate them. But earlier is better, obviously. And so uh, Mark, you know, is, tends to get more attention than the others in some ways. And what were the primary reasons for dismissing the Gospel of John as being an eyewitness account? Um, well, there are a number of things. So like, like the other Gospels, John does not claim to be an eyewitness account. Um, it's written in the third person about Jesus. Um, the only place where the author uses the first person pronoun is what, uh, at the very beginning he says, uh, the very beginning he says that the that when the word of God was made flesh, we beheld his glory. Uh, and so some people think, well, he's saying that he actually saw Jesus, which is, you know, obviously a possible way to read it. It's, I'd say, more commonly read as saying, you know, he revealed himself to us. That He's not saying that, you know, I was there. If he, if he was saying that I was there, then... Um, then you know he doesn't say it anywhere else and at the end of the gospel um he says that the uh, the disciple whom jesus loved um bore witness to jesus and he says the one who has seen these things has testified and we know that his testimony is true well there he's differentiating himself from the eyewitness <laughs> and so we're and so i so the first thing to point out is he doesn't claim to be an eyewitness either certainly not explicitly and I don't think implicitly, he doesn't claim to be John, the son of Zebedee, doesn't claim to be anybody like the other gospels he's writing, he's writing anonymously. Um, if he was an eyewitness, if he was somebody who had been with Jesus, seen him do what he did, hear, heard him say what he heard, you would almost certainly expect him to use the authority of his presence as to, to support his claims about Jesus. And, and he never does, it's always reported in the third person. Moreover, it's usually thought on the, because of its more advanced theological understanding of Jesus, far more uh, developed theologically than Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that it probably comes at a period. It's normally dated to the 90s of the common era or even a little bit later maybe. Um, and if that's the case, then uh, I don't see how it could have been written by somebody who was an eyewitness in the days of Jesus. The guy would have to be in his 90s or almost 100 years old. And that, uh, that, that did not happen a lot in the ancient world. <laughs> so, uh, I, so I don't think, so it doesn't claim to be by an eyewitness, and I think it's certainly not. Mike, JJ, thank you for your super chat. Michael E., thank you for your super chat. Without much new data coming in, how does innovation occur in the study of the New Testament? For example, is Jesus, Christianity is just a Greco-Roman myth, really a novel idea based on new findings? Oh, yeah. The, the idea that Romans made this thing up. <laughs> yeah, that's a new one. And it has like no credit. <laughs> no, it, I don't know. I mean, it's the kind of thing you'll find on the Internet and you'll find people writing books, you know, but not scholars. Scott, no, I, I don't know any scholar takes it. That's serious. Uh, it is so e it's so easy to destroy that idea. Uh, it is innovation, and it's not based on new findings. It's based on somebody wanting to make some money or to stir up, to stir up, to stir things up. So, um, where does innovation come from? There actually are innovative things that happen in uh, New Testament studies, just as there are in the study of all antiquity. Um, uh, Roman antiquity, Greek antiquity, Eastern, ancient Near Eastern antiquity, and stuff. The way the way the uh, innovation comes are from a couple of sources. One is new manuscripts appear, um, and so um, we find we, we continue to find new manuscripts, including manuscripts of the New Testament. I mean, every year it seems like some fragment or other of the New Testament shows up, and that that helps us a little bit know a little bit more about what the original text said. Also, new writings appear. Um, in, you know, not that long ago, uh, 16, 17 years ago, I don't know, yeah, no, the, maybe 19 years ago, the uh, Gospel of Judas uh, showed up, a uh, gospel that we knew about, 
who didn't have it. That didn't help us know more about Jesus per se, but it helped us know a lot about uh, more about early Christianity in ways. And so new discoveries help. The other thing that helps is that as scholarship develops, we, we just learn more. I mean, it seems crazy that you can learn more, but we, we are actually learning more things about the ancient world all the time through diligent research in uh, a lot of its detailed research that has uh, wider implications. Um, and so, um, I mean, I'll just, I'll give you an example from mis from my book, Misquoting Jesus, which is how you introduced this. Um, for, for almost all of modern scholarship, when scholars were trying to figure out what the words of the New Testament originally were, given the fact that we have so many different manuscripts, we have lots of different manuscripts of the New Testament, and, and, and people tended to be, think that the only thing that mattered was finding the uh, the original text of the New Testament. And they maintained, they consistently maintained, not always, but consistently maintained, that scribes never changed their writings of the New Testament when they were copying them for theological reasons. And now we just know that's, that's completely wrong. And that's just been within you know, the last 40, 50 years. And there were a couple of people who suspected that before, but the full studies of this haven't happened until, uh, until fairly recently. And I think what he meant by the question, like, is Christianity just a Greco Roman myth, is not referring to the idea that the Romans made the whole thing up. But, it, yeah. but you know, some scholars uh, see Christianity as having parallels with Greco Roman myth. And some other people uh, reading that literature, like mythicists, will say, oh, that's evidence that the whole thing is myth and it was just made up. Yeah. Well, you know, I wouldn't say that such as mythicists, they're the only ones who say that. Right. <laughs> there are other people who say that. <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, you know, scholars have known, um, Christian scholars since the second century have known that there are similarities between the stories of Jesus and the Greek and Roman myths. So that's that's not a new discovery. <laughs> that, that is that's an old discovery. And when you get when you have mythicists, uh, when you do have mythicists coming up with their kind of explanations for who Jesus really is, you know, he's really a sun god that crucif got crucified in the heavens or something. Yeah, they're just making that stuff up. There's no there are data behind it. <laughs> Which ancient sources say that, for example? <laughs> so you just make it up. It doesn't mean it's wrong because somebody made it. Maybe they have a keen insight, but uh, you know, most of it's like information and data. So, uh, but that yeah, that 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 would be right. This is not that's not based on new data. That's just you know dull data that people have uh, interpreted in different ways. And what about the Q source? Did the Q source that Matthew and Luke used undergo any revisions prior to them utilizing it? And basically, it, and my next part of the question is, does the contents of Q largely portray what Jesus actually said, or is even that highly questionable? Okay, so these are really complicated questions. Um and uh, we could do an entire show on this. But, you know, I, my friend Mark Goodacre has written books on this. <laughs> so it's, his books are meant to show Q never existed. Uh, and so the, he, has, he has stirred up that pot uh, because since the 19th century, it's been pretty much the consensus among scholars that there was a Q. Uh, and Mark Goodacre, following his teacher, who was following his teacher, <laughs> uh, uh, Michael Goulder was... Uh, Mark Goodacre's teacher, and he thought there was no Q, and he didn't think there was a Q because of this, his teacher, Farrer, and the Farrer hypothesis says there's no Q. So, so let me explain. I, I think probably most of your listeners know what we're talking about, but just in case. Um, I said earlier that Matthew and Luke both copied Mark and got a lot of their stories from Mark. There are also a number of sayings in Matthew and Luke that they have that Mark doesn't have. So they didn't get it from Mark because he doesn't have them, uh, but they're sometimes word for word the same. So there's copying going on again. And the question is, did, did Matthew copy Luke? Did Luke copy Matthew? Or did they both copy some source we don't have anymore? There are very good reasons for thinking that Luke did not copy Matthew and that Matthew did not copy Luke. Mark Goodacre's solution to this, the far hypothesis, is that actually Matthew, is, Matthew copied Mark and that Luke copied both Matthew and Mark. 
that's why you get the similarities between the three. But most scholars continue to think that that doesn't work. Uh, and that what happened is Matthew and Luke copied Mark and they had access to some other source that contained mainly Jesus sayings. They both had access to the source. Possibly it wasn't word for word the same and the different copies they had wherever they were and whenever they were living, but they had the same source. And scholars have called that source Q. Uh, it's called Q because the German word for this source, the, it's the sayings source. The, the sayings source, the word for source is Kvela in German, which is Q, U-E-L-L-E. And so it's the sayings Kvela. And so they just call it Q, short for Kvela. All right. So um, the uh, so if that uh, if that existed, uh, so let's I'm going to assume it did exist because I think I think it did. I think it did exist. I think that's the best explanation. So if it did exist, the question, two questions. One is, did it go through revisions? And secondly, does it accurately report what Jesus said? So with respect to revisions, this is a um, this is the claim of, uh, of a number of people. Uh, I think the claim is not nearly as uh, vibrant now as it was 20 or 30 years ago. But 20 or 30 years ago, there was a big push to argue that Q actually went through various revisions and that you can isolate the various levels of revision in Q. Um, this is a very tricky business because we don't have Q. <laughs> it's hard enough to show that a source you do have <laughs> went through revisions and which parts went to which revisions. This is trying to do it with a source we don't even have. And many people think that's just like that is just too speculative. You just can't do it as much as you like to. And it is worth noting that the people who really liked this hypothesis tended to be people who had a particular view of Jesus. So uh, just to kind of get in the weeds just for a second, uh, scholars since the beginning of the 20th century have argued, largely argued, it's not everybody's view, but the majority view has been that Jesus was an apocalyptic preacher who said that the world was going to come to a crashing end soon that God was going to wipe out everything opposed to him and he's going to reward his followers and destroy his enemies. And that was going to happen soon. So this is an apocalyptic view that Jesus is predicting the imminent end of the world. Um, in the 70s and 80s, 1970s and 80s, uh, and into the 90s, there were a number of scholars who didn't like that view of Jesus for one reason or another. And um, they argued that Jesus was not predicting an apocalyptic end that was soon to come. The problem they had, one of the problems they had with claiming Jesus did not claim that, one of the problems is that our two earliest sources, Mark and Q, consistently do show Jesus saying that. <laughs> so what do you do with that? Well, what they did with Q is they argued that Q actually went through numerous revisions. The first edition of Q, the one closest to Jesus, the first edition did not have apocalyptic materials in it. It was only at a later stage that apocalyptic materials got added to it. Therefore, our earliest source does not have Jesus as an apocalypticist. Okay, so it can fit their agenda very well. But other scholars look at it and say, well, you know, actually, it's kind of hard to <laughs> come up with multiple layers. And so they had Q1, Q2, and Q3. And so by the time you get to Q3, you have an apocalyptic Jesus, but that's later. <laughs> so... I don't think that's, I don't think today most people are, are doing that. So at least that's my impression. Um, so if there was a Q, and I think there probably was, all we know is that it was probably a document, must have been written, had to be in Greek, that Matthew and Luke had access to that mainly had sayings of Jesus. Is it necessarily accurate? Your second question. Does it re represent what Jesus really said? Object um, the sayings of Q to the same criteria that we do to other other bits of the gospel. Things, what Jesus says in this verse that's found in Q, does it coincide with what he says in other places, in other sources? Can you fit it into the first century? Is this something that a, a Christian follower would have desperately wanted to put on his lips or not? So those are the criteria. A number of things probably are authentic, and a number of them are probably not authentic. And you have to go one by one. How early do the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament date to? 
Um, so it's usually thought still today that our very earliest manuscript is uh, one that's called P52. Um, the oldest manuscripts we have are written on papyrus. Uh, later manuscripts are written on parchment, um, uh, vellum, uh, animal skin, animal skins. The earliest are written on papyrus, which is a, a reed that could be manufactured into a writing material. It's kind of like paper, but it's made out of this reed, papyrus. The earliest manuscripts, several, the first hundreds of years, are written on papyrus, and those manuscripts are, are known as P something or other. P52 is a papyrus manuscript. That's why it's P. It's 52 because it was the 52nd papyrus manuscript that was uh, known and cataloged. And so that's just the reason for P52. It's the size of a credit card. Um, it's um, uh, just a little piece, a little piece of a manuscript. The rest of the manuscript's been destroyed by whatever reason. And we have this little fragment and it contains verses from John, uh, from John chapter 18 and 19, the trial of Jesus before Pilate, uh, written on the front and, and the back. And scholars have traditionally dated this manuscript to the uh, first half of the second century. We can't put a precise date on it. It's dated on the basis of a handwriting analysis. We know how different Greek uh, scribes copied their manuscripts at different time periods. Uh, there's some debate about it. Some scholars now think it actually should be later than that. But um, sometime in the first half of the second century, that's our earliest scrap. Our earliest kind of um, like a fuller piece of something where you get multiple pages of something is around the year 200. We have uh, copies of the Gospels, for example, that are, um, they're not the whole Gospel of Mark or Luke or they're sizable chunks of, you know, most, you know, some virtually complete pages and other things missing. That's around 200. We don't have a complete manuscript in the entire New Testament. Uh, uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like the whole thing. We don't have uh, of any of those gods. We don't have a complete of any of those books until uh, the, the second half of the fourth century, around 370, 375 is when we get some of the fullest ones. And after that, you start getting the, the complete copies. So we do have, we do have some very early copies. If the Gospel of John was written around 95, say, and this thing was written, say, 125 or 140 or something, you know, then it'd be 40, you know, whatever that is, 30, 40 years later, we have a copy of, you know, just not much of a copy, but at least we have evidence of it uh, that early. Jay, um, thank you for your super chat. Michael E., thank you for your super chat. Did the Johannine community exist? Love your part. Love your podcast, Dr. Herman. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So, I, as you know, I've got a podcast called Misquoting Jesus, and this this uh, and Michael apparently listened to the episode where I interviewed uh, my colleague uh, Hugo Mendez, who is writing a book trying to argue there was no Johannine community in the sense scholars have argued since the 1970s. Um, I hope he's wrong because I've always taught it, <laughs> but he's got some pretty convincing arguments. I don't know. Uh, so I don't know if it exists or not. The Joh For those of you who don't know what this is, the Johannine community refers to the idea that between behind the uh, writings attributed to John, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and possibly the Book of Revelation of John, that the, but certainly the epistles and the Gospel all emanate out of uh, the same Christian community that was a kind of tightly knit community that had its own perspectives on things that were different from the perspective you get in, say, the communities of Paul or Matthew's community or Luke's community. The, it was a uh, it was its own community. And the similarities among these various writings can be attributed to the fact, taken as a fact, that they were written by authors with similar theological views in the same socio-historical context, the same, actually the same community. Um, Hugo Mendez, my, th this has been this has been an orthodoxy among critical scholars since the writings of J. Lewis Martin, his very important book, History and Theology in the Fourth Gospel, and uh, Raymond Brown, his book, The uh, Community of the Beloved Disciple. These are two really influential books, and they very interesting book, very 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 good books. Uh, but Hugo's trying to argue that in fact it's not true. Uh, and that there was no, you can't line this up with a community. So his book is going to be revolutionary uh, within our field. Um, I'm holding on to the idea of Johannine community for now. 
<laughs> and I think it's especially useful way of understanding what's behind the Gospel of John. I'm, I'm not as bothered about 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Hugo's spending most of his time right now in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. But I think that behind the Gospel of John, there is a distinct community, and that this author's views have been formed within the context of the life of that community, and it's shaped how he understands who Jesus is. I think it's still a very helpful way to understand the Gospel of John. But, you know, as with all things, I think, you know, scholarship advances, and, um, you know, I'm a dinosaur as it is, but I don't want to be an extinct dinosaur. So, I, you know, I accept things that are new that come along. <laughs> so if somebody convinces me that I'll be convinced. <laughs> but I don't have a stake in any of this stuff, personally. It's not like I don't have a stake in it. So I just, you know, I'm happy to go with what. But it takes something to convince me. Is that that it takes good evidence to convince me. You say that basically all we can do is for example, reconstruct Galatians as best we can. And the earliest manuscript of that text dates to around 200 CE, and we do not possess the original text of Galatians. That being an example of us not having a, any of the original texts of the various books in the New Testament. So in light of that, how do scholars go about reconstructing these texts from the various manuscripts? And how confident can one be that these texts at least largely resemble the originals? Um, so this is what my original scholarship was. This is, I did, I did my PhD dissertation dealing with this kind of question. I did a master's thesis dealing with this kind of question. I spent the first 20 years of my life, my scholarly life dealing with this question. And so this is a question that would take a long time to answer. <laughs> so, um, what I can say is that, uh, you know, I know, I think I know all, just about all the experts on this stuff in the, in the world for the last you know, 40 years or something. And, and I don't think anybody who's an act, expert who actually knows what this is about has serious doubts about basically having the basic right, right idea. That, that what When you read Galatians, you basically are getting most prob probably mostly what Paul wrote. It's possible that's not. It's possible that's not. Uh, and you can't know. This is the thing. People get upset with me because I say, well, we basically know, but like you can't know. They say, well, you just said you can basically know. Yeah, okay. So fundamentalists are really interested in knowing exactly which word was written in each place. Like you've got to know exactly what's going on. You cannot know that. Um, you probably have a pretty good idea. With something like the letter to the Galatians, it's a, a, let me explain the complications here because it's really, in fact, when I explain the complications, half of your people listening is going to say, yeah, actually, we can't know. But experts do think you can basically know. But here's the complication. Paul dictated the letter to the Galatians. And it's not just one community. Uh, Galatians is an entire region throughout what is now, if you if you think about Turkey and you go to the center, you go north to south, kind of north, north to south in the center, that was the region of Galatia. And there were numerous churches there. Paul's writing this letter to these numerous churches. And so that's interesting. Does it mean that he wrote one letter and each church copied it for the next church? Or does it mean that he wrote one letter and different scribes while he was dictating it, wrote down the letter that he's dictated? Did he write multiple copies? Did he make multiple copies? Did so he didn't do it himself because at the end of his letter, he indicates, he says, see with what large letters I'm writing you at the very end of this of Galatians, of Galatians, which is almost always taken to mean that some scribes written out what he dictated. And at the end, he added his little postscript so they would realize it's really from him. Okay. So he dictates this thing, uh, and we don't know how many he dictated, just one or many. So when he dictates, what if the scribe who's taking down the dictation writes a word wrong? Like he hears one word, and it's a different word. Or somebody in the room coughs, you know, or the, uh, the, the scribe's attention like strays for a second. What was that? Oh, okay. You know, so what if he changes it? What's the original text? Is it what Paul said, or is it what the scribe wrote? We have no access to what he said, but if was, what, what if the scribe wrote something wrong? Is the wrong thing the original text? And suppose there are 10 copies of it that Paul sent out. Well, if he sent out 10 copies, one of those 10 copies were slightly different from each other in places. Um, which one's the original text? And then it gets copied and it gets, and the copies get copied. And all 10 of them get copied and copied and copied. And we don't have any copies for, you know, 140 years when we get a copy. 
well, which one is the copy of, of the 10? And what if, what if what happened was you had these 10, nine of them got burned in fires, one of them survived, but it got copied by some other scribe who changed a few things. Then the original got lost. Then all the other copies came from the, the copy that the scribe changed. So that our surviving copies all go from the changed copy, not to, from the original copy. See what I'm saying? And so like, <laughs> so, so that shows the difficulty. And that's why fundamentalists just are, you know, they really, they really cannot claim that we know what these words were. We, we don't know. But, you know, if you're just thinking kind of about kind of practical probabilities, when somebody copies a letter of Paul, they, as a rule, are not trying to write their own letter. They're copying somebody else's letter. If they want to make their letter, they just write a letter. And so it is possible that scribes radically changed the letter to the Galatians. But if they did, among none of our hundreds of copies of it, do we have any evidence of it? Um, and so what we do have are lots of little changes and sometimes big changes. I mean, not huge changes, not like we have entire paragraphs missing or in in different manuscripts, but there are changes in, in Galatians and in all the books of the New Testament. There are places where we can't agree what the author originally said in all of these books. And so, you know, probably I think we pretty much know pretty much what Paul wrote, but we, we don't have the kind of certitude that conservative evangelicals want. Does the book of Acts and Paul's letters contradict one another in any significant ways? Um, I think the answer is absolutely yes, they do. It's um, So the book of Acts is about the spread of Christianity after Jesus' uh, death, resurrection, and ascension. The book of Acts is a historical narrative that covers 30 years from uh, the time of Jesus' ascension, well, from the time of his resurrection, to the time when Paul has been uh, arrested and is a prisoner in Rome, preaching the gospel in Rome. It's about how the, the apostles, especially Peter and John early on, spread the gospel, and then how Paul spread the gospel in the second two thirds of the book, and about his missionary journeys and so forth. Now, it's a historical narrative, and so one can ask, is the history that it narrates correct? Did it really happen the way Acts says? Most of the things that Acts talks about, we don't have any supporting evidence for one way or the other. You know, what, what happened on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus' death? Well, Acts has a story in chapter 2, and we don't have any other records from anybody of any kind to evaluate it. And so you evaluate those on other grounds. When it comes to Paul's missionary work, though, there are a number of things that Acts talks about that Paul also talks about in his letters. And so you can compare what Acts says with what Paul says about the same event. Um, and just about every time you do that, Acts tends to get kind of the broad thing right, tends to get the broad thing right, and it tends to get the details wrong, <laughs> and sometimes in really significant ways. I'll give you one example. Um, Paul, Paul starts out as a persecutor. Paul says that, Acts says that. Paul converted to believe in Jesus on the basis of some kind of vision he had. Acts says that, Paul says that. Okay, so the broad thing is right. Paul, after his conversion, um, is in uh, Damascus. Paul says that, Acts says that. Okay, great. Paul, in telling that part of the story, tells the Galatians, this is Galatians chapters one and two. He says, um, I, when I converted, I went to Arabia, and then I went back to Damascus. I was there for three years and I did not consult with the apostles who were before me. And he swears to God that he's telling the truth. I did not see. After three years, I went to Jerusalem and I saw Cephas and also James. Uh, that was it. So three years later. So he's trying to show, look, I did not get my message from the others. I got my message directly from Christ. I didn't even go to Jerusalem for three years. And then I only saw Cephas and a little bit of James. That's it. So that's his point. In the book of Acts, Paul gets converted. He's in Damascus. As soon as he go, leaves Damascus, he goes straight to Jerusalem. <laughs> it's the first thing he does. And he consults with the apostles. <laughs> Acts is trying to show that Paul and the other apostles were on the same page. 
they agreed on just a, they agreed on everything in the book of Acts. It's just one happy family among those apostles, Paul and the others. In Galatians, it's not that way at all. Paul does not consult with the apostles. He has his own gospel. If they disagree with him, he's they're wrong. And he has to actually go there to convince them that he's right. Uh, and so it's a very, very different portrayal, but it's down in the details. Because you can just look at the general picture. Persecutor, vision, Damascus, ends up seeing the apostles. It's all the same, right? <laughs> well, no, it's not. It's very different. Greg Helton, thank you for your super chat. Was a verse in the LXX re revised from past to future tense, so it, it appeared to foretell Christ? Uh, yeah, well, thanks, Greg. It's, it's a good question. Um, um, the, the one passage that I may be the one you're thinking of that a lot of people have uh, talked about is the, uh, is the passage in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Um, or, um, I, I don't know if this is the one, but uh, it may be. Uh, this is where uh, Isaiah is quoted in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew's birth narrative, Matthew quotes this passage, Isaiah 7, 14, to show why Jesus was born of a virgin. And Matthew quotes the verse as saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So a virgin will conceive and will bear, will have a son. And then you call him Emmanuel. Um, when you actually look at the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah 7, 14, it's worded very differently. For one thing, it doesn't use the word virgin for this woman. It doesn't use the Hebrew word virgin, Bethula. It uses uh, the Hebrew word for young woman. A young woman and that word Alma, young woman, it could mean a woman, young woman who's a virgin. It could mean a young woman who's not a virgin, it has nothing to do with her virginity. She's a young woman. <laughs> so a young woman has conceived uh, and she will bear a son uh, and you'll call, call his name Emmanuel, etc. So it's that she's already pregnant and she's going to, she's going to give birth to a, a, a boy, not a girl. She's going to give birth to a boy. Okay, so the question is, did uh, the Septuagint uh, revise from past to future? The reason that's kind of a complicated question is because uh, Greek does have uh, past tenses and future, ten uh, future tense and future tenses. Hebrew, technically speaking, does not have a past tense and a future tense. Hebrew doesn't work like uh, like. The languages most of us are familiar with where you get past and future tenses. It's a Semitic language. It's not Indo-European. In, in this Semitic language, they have what's called a perfect tense and an imperfect tense. And that does not translate immediately into past and future. A perfect tense refers to an event that has been completed. And an imperfect uh, tense, refer, tense refers to something that has not been completed. And you think, well, that's past and future, right? No, not necessarily. You can talk about something happened in the past, and when you're talking about it, you use the imperfect because in your story, it hasn't been completed yet. <laughs> and so imperfect just means the action hasn't been completed. The, the, the verse in Isaiah 7, 14 uses a perfect tense for this woman having conceived. It means she's conceived and she it's over and done with. She has conceived. The Septuagint, when Matthew quotes it, Matthew quotes it as a future tense, will conceive. He's basing his translation not on his rendering, not on the Hebrew, but on the Greek Septuagint. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, if, if the Septuagint had kept it in the past tense, Matthew would not have been able to use it probably to refer to the virgin birth. Kevin, non-traductive. Thank you for your super chat. Do you think that Jesus might have actually said Papias is 100 uh, sextillion grape story? Jesus must have said many things that weren't written down. Um, yeah, so I guess in this case it was written down because <laughs> we have it in Papias. <laughs> but it's a, good, it's a very good point. Why don't you get later, you know, you can get later gospels of things that are not written down in the, in the other gospels. Uh, scholars have, have a term for this. Actually, those are called the agrafa. 
uh, agrafa is spelled A-G-R-A-P-H-A, -A, grapha, like in graphite, the thing in your pencil, the thing you write with, and agrafa is something not written. And of course, all of these agrafa are written someplace because otherwise we wouldn't have access to them. Uh, so the question is, is this, is this agrafon singular, is this agrafon in Papias uh, possibly historical? And it's certainly possibly historical. Yes, it's possibly historical. Uh, I have scholar friends who think that, uh, why not? Jesus says, Jesus says, tends to think it's going to be pretty glorious in the future kingdom of God. And uh, so why not? Um, my sense is that Papias would have no way of knowing if Jesus really said it. He said that he learned this from people who knew the disciples of John, the disciple of Jesus. But the other stories that he tells, um, are also problematic. Um, he doesn't seem to have a clear line to uh, authentic sayings of Jesus or authentic events in the life of Jesus. As one example, he tells the story of the death of Judas, but in this case, he doesn't hang himself as in Matthew, and he doesn't fall head first and splatter all over the ground as in Acts. In this case, uh, God punishes him for uh, betraying Jesus and he swells up. He's so enormous that he can't walk down a street. His head won't fit between the buildings of the street. And it goes on to describe how horrible his genitals are. And he, when he needs to urinate, you know, worms and pus come out. It's like, it's really graphic. And eventually he kind of blows up. I mean, I don't know, he's like, he, and so, you know, so it's just, yeah, okay, it's possible that that's you know, what really happened. It's possible, but it doesn't seem likely. And I, I put this thing about the Jesus thing where he says that, you know, every, Every vine will have a thousand branches. Every branch will have a thousand, 10,000 branches. Every will have 10,000 boughs. And every bough will have 10,000 sticks. Every stick will have 10,000 grapes. Every grape, every 10,000 clusters. Every cluster will have 10,000 grapes. Every grape will yield 10,000, you know, vats of wine or whatever. It's like, you know, I just, I don't know. It doesn't seem consistent with the kinds of sayings that you get of Jesus in the New Testament, where you might have 30 and 60, 100 fold yield of wheat. But you don't have, you know, 106 billion. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure it's really consistent with Jesus' teachings otherwise. How different are the various manuscripts of the New Testament text? Um, this is not something that can be uh, quantified in the way that you can say, well, they're 76% different. <laughs> you can compare two manuscripts to each other and see how different they are, but it's very hard to know how to count. This is actually related to what I did for my PhD dissertation. Uh, it's trying to calculate the resemblances among manuscripts. And it's a, it's a very, very tricky business. Um, how do I put it? Um, there are hundreds of thousands of differences among our manuscripts. And even conservative textual critics today, some evangelical textual critics, think that there are something like half a million differences among our manuscripts. Everyone agrees the vast majority of those are completely insignificant. They don't matter for anything. Most, most of them, the vast majority of them, you cannot replicate in an English translation. So they're different in the Greek. You can't even, you can't even show the difference <laughs> in the English. And so they you know, they don't matter. Some of them matter a lot. Um, how many matter a lot? I don't know, hundreds, but not, half a million. <laughs> Some manuscripts are quite different, but they still recognizably the same. Any manuscript you have of Galatians is basically the same. There will be differences that interpreters take very, very seriously because the differences can matter a lot. Sometimes these differences affect the entire meaning of a passage. Some of them affect the entire meaning of a book. You can easily, easily, easily illustrate this with the Gospel of Luke, for example, which is, um, I, uh, which is, I did a podcast on the scribal changes of Luke from my Misquoting Jesus podcast, where I showed that they just take a handful of these things and it just completely changes what Luke's trying to say. So they're small, even if they're small changes, they can matter a lot. Um, a really good book on this that I that I like that uh, I had nothing to do with is uh, David Parker's book, uh, The Living Text of the Gospels. Uh, where he shows how different gospel manuscripts can be. And I think it's a really interesting book. He asked me to read it before he published it. He wanted me to give him some feedback on it. So I read it and he had this chart 
where he had these three columns of the story. And um, I read it, and I, when I read through, I was, it was, I was just reading it, reading these columns, and I thought, why is he presenting a Matthew, Mark, and Luke thing? You know, why, why is he presenting the story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Because they were so different. And I thought, that's weird. You know, he had sentences thrown in and sentences taken out. I said, wow, why is he doing that in the book about the manuscript? Then I realized, wait a second. These are not three different gospels telling the same story. These are, this is the same gospel in three different manuscripts. <laughs> Whoa, that's a nice illustration. So look, I don't have a percentage available. Um, some of them are different, but the differences tend to be small, but so the sm sometimes they're big, but the small ones even can make a big difference. The Muslim apologists, thank you for your super chat. Would the Gospel of Thomas be closest to what scholars refer to as the Q source? Ah, good question. And it depends what one means by closest. Um, so there are, uh, in the Gospel of Thomas, which was discovered in 1945, there are 114 sayings of Jesus. And there's no narratives. There's no action. Jesus, you know, there's no crucifixion. There's no resurrection. But there's no healings. There's, there's no interaction. There's no, there's no stories. Just saying, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said. Um, and so uh, that would be the closest thing we have to Thomas in terms of its form and structure. If Q, that'd be the closest thing to Q. If, if people are right, that Q is basically a list of Jesus' sayings, then Thomas would be the closest, one of the closest things we have to, at least early on, one of the closest things we have, have to it. It'd be a sayings source like Q. Um, and a number of the sayings in Q are, uh, are found in slightly different forms in the Gospel of Thomas. So there's also overlap. Uh, and so, uh, but it, it's not close in the sense that if you read Thomas, you know, you're, you're reading something like Q. It's a very different uh, document and it has a lot of, lot of things in Q in Thomas. There are a lot of things in Thomas that you would never, ever have found in Q. About half of these sayings um, strike modern readers who are familiar with the Gospels. About half of Thomas' sayings saying strike modern readers as very odd because they're not like the Gospels. And these odd sayings, uh, you know, it, it just shows these things are not like the stuff you would, you, you would have found in Q. How do scholars distinguish from an accidental change in the text when, when they were copying it by hand in, in these different manuscripts from a deliberate change in these manuscripts? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. So the question is, you've got a scribe copying a manuscript. And so he's got a manuscript and he's copying it. And, and, he, and he, he words the verse differently, word, he words the sentence differently from what's in his copy. And is it that he just like messed up or do you want to change it um, and change it intentionally? Almost everybody's convinced that both things did happen. Um, when you have when you have something like the woman, the story of the woman taken in adultery, which was added to the Gospel of John by scribes, it you know it wasn't an accident. It wasn't by a slip of the pen. It's not like misspelling a word because you're not paying attention. Somebody added an entire story. Okay, so that's probably intentional. Um, it is uh, sometimes it's pretty obvious that there are accidents. Most of mo the vast majority of the changes are must be purely accidental. People will misspell a word, they'll leave out a word, they'll add a word, they'll repeat the word twice, they'll, they'll leave out a sentence, they'll leave out a line because this line ends with some words and the next line ends with the same words. And when the scribe copies those words, he's copied them from the first line, but then he thinks he copied them from the second line. So it goes to the third line, he's left out a line. So like, it's just an accident. Um, and most of the, a lot of the accidents don't make any sense. So it's pretty clear it's an accident. But there are places where it's clearly intentional, and there are a lot of places where we just can't tell. You have to kind of make an argument um, because sometimes I'll give I'll give you an example of this. This would be an example that maybe a lot of people will not know. Um, in Romans chapter five, verse one, Paul is explaining now that he's laid out his idea about how people are made right with God, how they are justified with God. Um, he says in Romans right after he's done that, he says in chapter five, verse one. Um, now that we have been justified, um, we have peace with God. Okay, 
But some manuscripts say, now that we have been justified, let us have peace with God. In other words, we need to go out and find it. And it's a difference of one letter. It's a difference between an Omicron and an Omega, uh, the O letter, a long O or a short O. And if somebody's dictating this letter, the long O and the short O sound exactly the same. <laughs> so did a scribe change it because he just misheard it? Or did a scribe change it because he thought the theology was wrong? Like if he said, if it said, let us have uh, peace with God, someone's saying, yeah, no, 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 it can't be let us have. Uh, it must be we do have. Of course we do if we're justified. Or, you know, and so they changed it. So there's no way to know what was going on in the scribe's head in some cases. In other cases, it's pretty clear. Warren Maroney, thank you for your super chat. If we don't have the original source autographs for at least one, the ones tested to be like Q, L, M, et cetera, how can we really know what Jesus said? Well, as I was saying, I don't think we can really know if what we mean is can we know for certain. And it's even more complicated than that because Q, M, and L, and Mark, et cetera, were written in Greek. And Jesus was speaking in Aramaic. So even if you know what the Greek version of his saying is, you don't know how it corresponds necessarily to the Aramaic. Not only that, but the sayings have been in circulation before anybody wrote them down. Even if you had Q, L, and M, even if you had the originals, they were getting these sayings from stories that had been circulating for decades before they wrote them down. So how... Just having Q wouldn't tell you if Jesus really said it. It just means you've got this Greek copy of things that somebody thought he said. And so, uh, but then, so it's it's problematic because of the oral tradition that went on for years and then decades before anybody wrote them down. It's complicated by the fact that it's gone from Aramaic into Greek, but then it's complicated by the fact that we don't have the originals of any of these sources. And so scribes change those and say, so, oh, my God. So it gets really complicated. But at every level, what you do is you establish probabilities. It's a very exacting business. And it's it's really hard. And you've got to know the ancient languages. And you've got to go one verse, virtually one word at a time, and spend years doing it. You know, it's not the kind of thing you just got to do it. And so uh, but the people who spend years doing it try to establish levels of probability. You know, look. This looks like it probably is what Matthew wrote and is just like what you find in Luke. So it probably did come from Q and this probably is what Q wrote. Okay, if that's what Q wrote, what was the Aramaic behind it? And if it's the Aramaic behind it, is it something that Jesus originally said or not? That's the kind of sequence you have to go through. Um, and each step is very difficult. What were often the theological motivations for some of these deliberate textual changes? In the, um, uh, the generation before me, in the 19, I guess, did it come out in the late 1960s? I can't remember right now, when Eldon App wrote a book called The Theological Tendencies of Codex Bizet in Codex Cantabrigiensis. <laughs> <laughs> There's a title for you. Uh, Eldon was a great, is a great textual scholar. Um, he was uh, sort of a generation before me. And he argued that there's a particular manuscript of the book of Acts, that um, Codex D, that actually the author, uh, the, the scribe of the Codex, implemented his anti Jewish sentiments into his account. He changed them more anti Jewish. Um, that got me thinking when I was doing my work and elder assessors, but not many who thought that. So uh, in uh, my first really major book was called The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. And it was written and uh, it got published, I think, in 1993, maybe. And what I did, is every manuscript difference that I could find um, in the entire New Testament, verse by verse to examine whether it looked like the changes could have been made because of Christological issues, because of controversies over who Christ was. Was he fully human, but not divine? Was he fully divine, but not human? Was he what this, that, and the other thing? And I categorized every one that I could find. And I, that's what my book is, The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, which argued that there were there are dozens and dozens of important, some of them really important, 
changes of the text that appear to have been made intentionally, appear to have been made intentionally, that change the meaning because of Christological controversies. Um, that has been, that's, that's the main theological controversies that we know about. Um, but, you know, other people could do other kinds of books. I had a, I had a PhD student, for example, write a book um, year, many years later, um, uh, Wayne Cannaday published book, a book that tried to show that Christians trying to defend the Christian faith against pagan attacks changed their manuscripts and places to make the Bible and the New Testament more suitable for use against opponents, pagan opponents. And he tried to show that. Uh, and so, and uh, Kim Haynes Eitzen and others have written to try and show how women and views of women have changed in manuscripts and so on. So there are some, but the, the, the one particular theological one that we know about are the Christological controversies. Uh, and I don't know if that's the majority of the changes, but they're the ones I know, I, I think they probably are. John B, All thank right. you for your super chat. Do you think that there's anything to Richard Miller's idea that the early Christians didn't hang their hat on the gospels being literal, literally historically true? Um, I don't, I don't think so. Um, but you know, we don't, you, you can't know for sure. And the reason you can't know for sure is because we don't have any readers reports. <laughs> you know, you know, when, you're, when you're a sophomore in high school, you got to do a reader's report, you know, like report what's in this book. We don't have any of those. Um, what we have uh, fairly soon, at least in the second century, are Christian authors talking about the Gospels and quoting the Gospels. And in every case, they appear to think that they were literally true. Um, they never take them as pure metaphor or as non-historical. They might think that they have metaphorical significance or theological significance, but it's never at the expense of them being literally right. Um, the early readers appear to have all taken them as literally true. Um, I think many people today are inclined to think, oh, they couldn't have, really? Come on. <laughs> but, you know, in the 20, 21st century America, many of us might look at stories in the Gospels and think, there's no way a sane human being can believe that. But, you know, the reality is that over, you know, probably around 2 billion sane people do believe it still. <laughs> and there's no reason to think they didn't in the ancient world. I, I don't know of any credible reason to think that they were not taken literally. And in the the earliest references to them, they are taken literally. So um, I think they were taken literally. What do you make of Irenaeus suggesting that the Gospel of Mark portrays a separated Jesus from the Christ, similar to that of the Gnostics who embrace a separationist theology? I don't think Irenaeus takes that view. I think he argues against it. So I'd have to see what passages uh, you're referring to. Irenaeus, um, he doesn't, he, he does refer to Gnostic groups that appear to think that when Jesus was baptized, as he is in the Gospel of Mark, and the Spirit of God came upon him, that that was when the, uh, the eon from the Pleroma entered into Christ. So in Gnostic think, okay, I guess I need to back up for a second. <laughs> so uh, I need to explain a separationist Christology and how this relates to Gnosticism, sorry. But not, Gnostics are people who were groups of, Christian Gnostics are groups of Christians who believed that it wasn't the death and resurrection of Jesus that brought salvation. It was the secret knowledge that he brought, knowledge about who human beings really were. The humans actually within us, we have a soul that came from a higher realm. And if you know yourself, you know who you really are based, then you can, you are, you're given the knowledge necessary to return to this higher realm uh, at death. And they are, some Gnostics argued that Jesus himself did not belong to this realm, which means that he couldn't have been born here. He wasn't, he wasn't a physical creature the way we are. He, he's not from here. He's, he came for a while, the divine Christ from above, from the, the area, the divine realm that they call the Pleroma, the fullness. The, a, Christ came down and came into the body of the man Jesus. So that Jesus was just a man like the rest of us, but he but he he was human like the rest of us. But but the Christ came into Jesus at his baptism, which is why he could begin preaching such 
amazing teachings and why he could why he could do such amazing miracles is because a divine being was within him. But that and so that happens at the baptism. And then when Jesus is crucified, the divine element leads Jesus to go back to the Pleroma. So it's just between his baptism and his crucifixion that Jesus has the Christ being within him. So that's a separationist Christology because you have the man Jesus who is a separate being from the divine Christ and they're temporarily united. Uh, and so Gnostics argued that. And, and Irenaeus talks about that view and he makes fun of it. <laughs> and he and he gives a very interesting he gives some very interesting information that we wouldn't have otherwise. We don't know if it's completely reliable, but he says that, for example, there's a Gnostic group that points out that when the dove comes upon Jesus at his baptism, um, the Gospel of Mark says that the dove, the Spirit of God, come, comes into Jesus, ace auton in the Greek. He comes into him. It can't mean upon him, but more normally be into him. And these Gnostics point out that the Greek word for dove, uh, peristeron, uh, if you add up the letters, like the first letter, the pi is worth a certain amount, the iota is worth a certain amount, the s, the, they use their alphabet. Letters of the alphabet are also their numbers, okay? So every word has letters that have each have a number. You can add up the numbers. If you add up the word for dove, the Greek word for dove, it adds up to 801. That is the same number if you add up alpha and omega. Christ is the alpha and the omega. The Alpha and the Omega come into Jesus when he is baptized. <laughs> See, that's how they interpret this text. So Irenaeus makes fun of that. So I don't, I don't know. And let, maybe Jacob, you've got some passages in mind, but I don't, I don't know that Irenaeus accepts the separationist Christology. He holds to an incarnational view. Yeah, I wasn't trying to say that it, that it was Irenaeus' oh, okay. view, but it oh. comes from. Uh, yeah, it comes from page 174 in, in your uh, misquoting Jesus. Yeah. When you, uh... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, he definitely talks about the view. And he says that the, um, and, you know, there's the, some of the church fathers oh, indicate. Oh, that, correction. I'm at page 172. Okay. Okay. But he talked about these Gnostics and he, he argues against it. But I, I point that out in my book. I actually deal with it at greater length in my book, Orthodox Corruption of Scripture, because I try to show how. Scribes sometimes change their texts in order to preclude that kind of argument from Mark. Warren Maroney, thank you for your super, for your super chat. Did the earliest Christians have the highest Christology as we do today, especially in light of adaptionism, subordinatism, development? Yeah, so... Um, so when when scholars talk about Christology, they sometimes talk in terms of a high Christology and a low Christology. And what they mean by that is that if Jesus is both human and divine, human means he's kind of down here on earth with the rest of us, and divine means he's up there in heaven with God. And, you know, how does it work exactly? Is he more human or more divine? Or is he like 50% of each? Or is he 100% of each? Or what is it? A low Christology says that Jesus is principally human and maybe he becomes a divine being. But it starts out that he's a, so that's a low Christology because he's not inherently God. He doesn't start out as God. He's a human that God chooses. A high Christology says that Christ is principally God. And a really high Christology, it may be held by a lot of people today. It was declared a heresy in early Christianity. The highest Christology is that Jesus is not human at all. He's not at all from down here and that he's God. And even on earth, he's God. He's not human. He only seems to be human. That was a view that uh, scholars have called docetism. And it's a view that was condemned early in the second century uh, by Orthodox church fathers who said, look, if Jesus isn't really human, he couldn't die for sins. <laughs> if he didn't have human blood, he couldn't shed his blood. If he didn't shed his blood, you're not saved. <laughs> and so they, they, they didn't like that idea. Um, did the earliest Christians have a very high Christology? My view is that they did not, but they did think that Jesus was divine. By Christian in this context, I'm referring to people who believe that Jesus is the way of salvation. I think that belief starts after Jesus' death. I think it starts as soon as some of his followers think that he got raised from the dead. Uh, I think this was some of his disciples. 
who uh, some of them said they had seen him alive. And if he's alive, he's not here, obviously, look around. So where is he? They thought that he had been taken from the realm of the dead and taken up to heaven to live with God and that he's going to come back. So in ancient thinking, Greek, Roman, Jewish, anyone who's taken up to the divine realm is made immortal. They, uh, and immortal in ancient Greek thinking, or ancient thinking generally, meant godlike, being, god, being a god. I think the earliest followers of Jesus thought that Jesus was made into a divine being at his resurrection. Some later came to think, oh, it happened at his baptism, so his whole ministry was divine. And then later they said, oh, actually, he got born of a virgin, so he's divine his entire life. Later they said, actually, he existed before he was born, and the, the Christology got higher and higher. It didn't get higher and higher at the same time in every place. People at different places at different times had different Christologies, just as they are today. But I think the earliest Christology was adoptionist, where Jesus is adopted to be the Son of God at his resurrection. Eventually, uh, Jesus is thought himself to be inherently God. But for a long time, most Christians thought that meant that he was subordinate to God the Father, that he's not equal with God. How can you be equal with God? God's almighty. Somebody else can't be almighty. If you've got two almighties, neither one of them is almighty. <laughs> and so, so he's got to be subordinate. So the Son of God is not as great as the Father. And so, so they were subordinate. But then uh, when you get into the fourth century, starting with the Council of Nicaea, especially, uh, they started saying, no, he's equal with God. He's actually equal with God, the same substance with the Father. Uh, and so at that point, that's a pretty high Christology. And they didn't have that early on, I think. Gettysburg Demoniac, thank you for your super chat. If we found an early copy of Mark, do you think Jesus would be convicted for something about van blasphemy? Uh, I don't think he is convicted of blasphemy in Mark. Uh, he the, the he is convicted in the sense that the high priest says he's guilty of committing blasphemy, but he's not condemned to death for it. The legal conviction is over his claim that he uh, called himself the king of the Jews in Mark and in all the other Gospels. But I think the question is, do I think, you know, at, at the trial of, in Mark's Gospel, the high priest um, is trying to find some way to bring a charge against Jesus. And he asks him, are you the Messiah? Throughout Mark's gospel up to this point, Jesus has never openly said he's the Messiah. But when the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one, the son of God, Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven uh, and glory of the father or whatever. And so, um, and so he says that and the high priest screams out blasphemy tears his robe and says he's worthy of death. And everybody of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council agrees. And they hand him over to Pilate, but not on charges of blasphemy. <laughs> so it's very interesting. One, one reason it's really interesting that many people haven't noticed is that Jesus never commits a blasphemy. Now, people try to construe this passage in Mark 14 so that Jesus commits a blasphemy, but he does not. When the high priest says, are you the Messiah, the son of God? He's asking him, are you the future king of Israel? Jesus says, I am. That's not a blasphemy. Um, some people say, well, the fact that he said, I am, is a blasphemy because he's claiming the name of God. No, I don't think he is. <laughs> uh, if somebody asks you something, are you this? In Greek, you often just reply, I am. You know, uh, are, you the, are you the guy who threw the trash on my lawn? Yeah, I am. <laughs> it doesn't, so, uh, and it's not that everywhere in the New Testament where the phrase ego me, I am means I am God. Even in the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John is the only place where I am refers to God, Gospel of John. But even in the Gospel of John, in John chapter 9, the man born blind is healed by Jesus. The Pharisees don't believe Jesus could have done it. They ask the guy, are you the guy who's born blind? And he replies, ego me, I am. They don't take him out to stone him to death. He's just answering their question. <laughs> so when it comes as an answer to a question, it's not, it's not claimed to be so. Jesus doesn't, he's not blaspheming and claiming he's the Messiah. He's just saying he's the future king. He, there's no blasphemy there. He's not saying I am, is just answering the question. And he's not blaspheming by saying the high priest is going to see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. That's what Daniel says. 
All he's saying is that Daniel's prophecy is going to be fulfilled in your day. That's not a blasphemy. So the problem is, I think this may be what uh, our Gettysburg demoniac uh, legion here is uh, referring to, is that there's no blasphemy there. Um, maybe he's not referring to that. But um, the question is, would he have been convicted by something else? Uh, if we got the original mark? No, I don't think so. I think what we've got is probably what happens in the original mark. I can't prove it. And, you know, I'm not going to stake my, I wouldn't stake my house on it, but I think there's no reason not to think so. Every copy of Mark has that ending, has, has that passage like that. So I don't see, I don't have any reason to suspect it's not original to Mark. Ultimate apologist, Mr. Cruz, Super Chat. Do you think that there is a distinct theological shift from John 3, 1 to 15 to John 3, 16 to 21? Is the latter part of the original text? Okay, it's a good question. It's a little bit complicated. I, I'm not going to get into all of it. I will say for those who don't know that uh, John 3 is where um, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus, where uh, Nicodemus um, comes up to him and says, we know you're a great teacher or sent from God. And Jesus tells him, you must be born from above or you can't see the kingdom of heaven. Sometimes translated, often translated, you must be born again. Uh, but it's it's word that probably means you must be born, have a heavenly birth if you're going to see the kingdom of heaven. Um, and then John, Jesus launches into this discussion with Nicodemus where Jesus goes into a monologue for a while. In verse 16, we get the famous uh, verse that used to be behind the home plate every year during the, home, the World Series. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that, that anyone who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, uh, and it goes from there uh, in John. So is there a break between what Jesus is saying in 15 and what happens then with 16 and following? The chapter goes all the way to verse 31. And I think most people think that 16 through 31 is a kind of unit. The, I, I don't know anybody who, I don't know any textual scholar or any scholar who thinks that the end of the chapter was not original. It is almost certainly original to John. It uses jo Johannine vocabulary. It's in Johannine style, writing style. It is theologically right up the line of what John has to say elsewhere. So I think the end of John 3 does go back to John. The big question, as it turns out, uh, is one that would not occur to most people. It has to do, Jesus stopped talking in this chapter, and when does the narrator start? Uh, so the problem, and it's precisely at the break that this person is identified between chapter between verses 15 and 16. Different, the, the original manuscript and none of our Greek manuscripts has punctuation, and so we don't have quotation marks. So we don't know where Jesus is being quoted. Is it from chapter chapter 3, verses 1 to 15, or is it all the way to the end of verse 31? Some, a lot of scholars think that it ends with verse 15, that Jesus' quotation ends with 15, and the narrator is the one that starts in with verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Um, and that the rest of it is not quoting Jesus. But in a number of translations, the quotation marks come at the end of verse 31, so that's the entire thing that Jesus said. Uh, and so there's a dispute, and there's no way to resolve it satisfactorily to everybody. Uh, everybody's, you might use that probably Jesus stops talking in verse 15. But I don't think that makes 16 and following a later edition. I think it was original. Gettysburg, Demoniac, thank you for your super chat. Does Mark 12, 35, 37 suppose that Jesus knew he wasn't from Davidic descent? Our Gettysburg Demoniac is reading the text very carefully here. Okay, this is this controversy where uh, the Sadducees, uh, Jesus has come to Jerusalem the last week of his life, and the Sadducees um, are trying to trip him up. They're trying to get him to say something that will get him in trouble. And so he turns the tables on them and he asks them, how can, how can the Messiah be the son of David? Because um, David calls uh, the son, his son, the Lord in the Psalm, in the Psalm, what is it? Psalm 110 says, uh, the Lord God said to my Lord, David, uh, you are my son today. No, you, you're, I'm sorry. Ah, you are, uh, it's not you're my son. Uh, oh yeah, uh, my Lord says to my Lord, 
and then, yeah, he does quote the thing about, I'll, I'll make your enemies footstool uh, under your feet. So God is calling him Lord. So, uh, oh, but it's in David's psalm. That's what it is. David allegedly wrote this psalm. And so he calls the son of David, the, uh, it's written by David, the son of, yeah, it's the son of David. It's written by David. And he calls the future Messiah Lord. How can he call him Lord if he's his son? That's the question. So Jesus asked this question to the Sadducees. They have no idea. I don't know how that works. And so Jesus, well, I won't answer your question either. <laughs> that kind of thing. So doesn't that presuppose that Jesus knew that he was not of Davidic descent? Because how can the Messiah be the son of David? Can't be the son of David if he's the Lord of David. Um, there are a number of ways to interpret this passage. One thing to say is we don't know if Jesus ever said it. So the question really is whether Mark thought that Jesus wasn't of Davidic descent. Um, Mark, though, does have Jesus called son of David in this gospel. And so, uh, uh, and so he does think that Jesus is the son of David, apparently. So how do you understand this text? One way to understand it, this is my favorite way of understanding, is that Mark is pulling a kind of trick that you find in other controversies in ancient Greek writings. You find it a lot in the writings of Plato. When Socrates is having a discussion with somebody about what something means or what something's all about, Socrates almost never comes up with the answer. What he does is he confuses the people he's talking to to make them realize they don't know the answer. This is part of Socrates' strategy to show that he's smarter than anyone else because he knows that he doesn't know, and he proves to these other people they don't know. So it's not meant to have an answer. It's meant to confuse the opponent. And I think that's what's going on with Jesus and the Sadducees here. He comes up with a conundrum that they can't answer. And uh, so since they can't answer his conundrum, he's not going to answer what they want to know. Bergen Maniac, thank you for your super chat. On what grounds were the titles of authorship assigned to each of the Gospels? Tradition, eyewitness, location of community? Um, we don't know for certain. The, the first time that they are called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is in the writings of Irenaeus, whom we talked about earlier. Um, um, we have some pretty good speculation that uh, that has a wide, pretty wide agreement among scholars, I think. Um, so uh, two of the Gospels, Matthew and John, are attributed to, um, uh, to disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus. Mark and Luke are attributed to companions of Peter and Paul. Uh, and so you get two disciples and the accounts, you know, connect with Peter and Paul, the two most important apostles. And so that's good. But why? But why, why for each of these? Uh, in some cases, it's more obvious uh, than in others. In the case of the gospel, it's not obvious in any case. Uh, I'll go backwards. Gospel of John. John has a figure called the, the beloved disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. And he seems to be an eyewitness to what happened in Jesus' life. And people came to think that John, that, that the uh, disciple Jesus loved is the one who wrote the gospel, actually wrote the gospel. Well, who would be the disciple that Jesus loved who could write the gospel? Somebody who was with Jesus in his ministry. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three closest disciples are Peter, James, and John. It must be one of them, but it can't be Peter because Peter shows up alongside the beloved disciple in the gospel of John, so he can't be the beloved disciple. It can't be James because James was known to have been martyred early in the early days of the church. Uh, very early on, he was martyred by King Herod. That leaves John. So John is the blood disciple who wrote the Gospel of John. That's the logic there. Uh, Gospel of uh, the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke um, is written by the same person who wrote the Book of Acts. The Book of Acts, in four passages, talk, the author talking about Paul's missionary journeys shifts from talking talking about what Paul and his followers did to what we did what happened to us that makes it look like he was a companion of Paul. Acts is largely about how Paul's missionary work converted Gentiles. Both Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are concerned about the conversion of Gentiles. That appears to mean that it's a Gentile author. 
Who is a Gentile companion of Paul? Well, we know from the Pauline letters that Paul had a Gentile companion named Luke, who was a doctor. And so they said, okay, that's who wrote Luke and Acts. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is a, uh, is a shorter version, uh, uh, and it's, uh, it is not attributed to one of the, uh, the disciples, but it is thought to have apostolic, um, apostolic authority. Um, the, uh, Peter is a prominent figure in the uh, Gospel of Mark, as in the others, but in Mark, uh, he stands out. And so it's thought, well, uh, this is somebody who's giving uh, Peter's account, but Peter doesn't claim to have written it. And so it was known that Peter had a companion in early Christianity named John Mark. And so they said John Mark was the companion of Peter. He wrote this Gospel. Matthew was thought to be written by one of the disciples, but which one? Um, there, uh, some people uh, noted that the call of Matthew in, Luke, in Matthew chapter 9, when Matthew's called to be a disciple, uh, the author of Matthew has changed the name of Levi. This, got, this accounts in the Gospel of, of Mark, but there is the call of Levi. Matthew changes it to Matthew, and some people said, well, huh, this must be somebody closely connected with this. And maybe he has two names. And so it must be Matthew. Matthew and Levi are the same person. So Matthew, who else would be concerned about Matthew? This must be Matthew's version. And so they came up with Matthew. So anyway, so those are, they, they came up with reasons. The real reasons, um, I think, are probably hard to know historically. Hard to know why those four. That's the logic people started using once they started using logic. Teresa Werby, thank you for your super chat. Why wouldn't early writings have been uh, started to be compiled in Israel within the first few years after Jesus is alive, rather than only oral tradition? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the the there there seem to be a couple of reasons for it. The earliest followers of Jesus, of course, were his disciples and those that they they knew. Um, in Israel at the time, uh, literacy was extremely low. The fullest study of this phenomenon by a woman named Catherine Hetzer called Literacy in Roman Palestine argues that only 3% of the population could write. To be able to write a book required years and years and years of education. Um, Today, that's common. Most people go through high school. A lot of people go through college. But most college kids could not write a book like the Gospel of Mark. They just couldn't write it that way. It takes years and years of practice. Um, Jesus' followers were lower class, illiterate peasants from Galilee who spoke Aramaic. These Gospels, our Gospels are written in Greek. Could there have been earlier Aramaic Gospels? There could have been, but we don't have any trace of them. And there's nothing to suggest that the apostles could write. Um, why didn't somebody start writing one 10 years later? Um, I don't know. Maybe they did. Luke, Luke, Luke claims that many people preceded him in writing Gospels, but he's writing like, you know, 50 years after Jesus' death. Um, one reason people have speculated that Christians were not interested in writing Gospels is because uh, they all were convinced that Jesus was returning soon and that it was going to happen soon in their own day. So who are you going to write a Gospel for? You're not going to write it for posterity. There's not going to be any posterity. <laughs> and so there may, it may be that with the passing of time, they just trusted that, you know, people are telling these stories. The apostles started the stories. These are stories from the apostles. That's fine. They trusted oral tradition then. They, they shouldn't have, but they did. They trusted oral tradition. And, uh, and they probably thought it was good enough. But as soon as the apostles start dying off, and maybe even after they're all dead, people say, look, somebody needs to write this down. And by that time, you have educated people who can do it, and people who think, okay, Jesus isn't coming back next week, so I'm going to do it. Greg Helton, thank you for your super chat. Bart, what is the likelihood that the story of Judas's betrayal is fiction, and have you written about this question? Um, yes, I have written about it. Um, I mentioned earlier the Gospel of Judas um, that was discovered uh, not, not long ago. Uh, in the early 2000s, um, it appeared, reappeared. Um, and um, I, was, um, I was asked by National Geographic to, to look into this gospel with a team of, of others. 
Uh, and so we, we had access to it before it was public. And, uh, and so I got really interested in this gospel of Judas and I got really interested in Judas. <laughs> and um, we had to sign non-disclosure uh, agreements. So we couldn't talk about it publicly, but I got them to agree to let me write a book about it that could be released six months after the public announcement of it. And so I wrote a book called The Lost Gospel of Judas Iscariot. And I decided to make the book not just about this gospel, which is a Gnostic gospel that is not historically reliable, but is very interesting. I also have, though, a historical interest in Judas himself. And so a chunk of my, a large chunk of my book is about the historical Judas. And one of the things I consider is whether the betrayal is fiction. Um, I think that it's not fiction. I think that there really was a Judas named Jude, who was identified as somebody named Judas Iscariot and that he uh, and that he really did betray Jesus. Um, my reasoning for that takes about a chapter to explain, so I'm not going to be able to get into it. The, the argument that's floated around more and more these days is that Judas was made up as a kind of anti-Jewish slander. Uh, the name Judas sounds like uh, Jew and uh, comes from you know, Judah, the land of the Jews. And so it, is it just an accident that the Judean, the Jew, is the one who betrays Jesus? And people thought, you know, it's really, that's a little bit too uncomfortable to be, uh, you know, to be false. And probably it's made up. <laughs> and so um, that's a, it's a good argument, but I don't think it's right. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I just don't think I don't think it has the balance of probability on its side. Several. I'll just say a couple of things very quickly. One is he's consistently identified as Iscariot. We have no idea what the word Iscariot means, <laughs> and we have ideas. There are lots of ideas. There are like 27 ideas what Iscariot means, but it's not obvious, and it's not the kind of name you would expect somebody to give to this person because we don't know what it means. <laughs> and so you'd expect him to. And so uh, that's one thing. More important thing is. The, uh, the betrayal, of course, is attested widely in independent sources with various stories about it. That helps confirm that it probably goes way back. Third thing is it doesn't seem to be the kind of story that Christians would have invented. It doesn't seem to have been the kind of story that Christians would have invented. And so um, the reason is because this is one of Jesus' insiders. Jesus is supposed to be this authoritative son of God when people, you know, his followers are just absorbed with his authority. And here this guy just goes against his, one of his followers. You could see like one of the members of the Sanhedrin, maybe, or a Sadducee or a Pharisee, you know, coming up with the goods, but not one of his own followers. That just, you know, he has no more authority than that. And so there are, there are reasons uh, for thinking that uh, that there was this Judas Iscariot. And I, I go into greater depth in my book, but my short answer is no, I don't think it's made up. I think it really happened in some way. I don't know exactly how it happened, but I think it, it did happen. Gettysburg, Demoniac, thank you for your super chat. What heretical sect of Christianity has the best foundation for their doctrine in the text of the, of the New Testament? Uh, I don't know whether they mean modern sect or ancient sect. Do you have an idea? I don't know. He's not specifying. Okay. So um, my view is that virtually every sect of Christianity has a very good foundation for their doctrine in the text of the New Testament. Um, the reason is that the text of the New Testament is not self-interpreting, meaning that anytime you have words on a page, they don't mean something until you provide them with a meaning. You can't ask a word what it means. I mean, just now, I just read this thing, what heretical sect, and I didn't know whether it meant ancient or modern, and I can't ask the text the question and get an answer. I have to interpret it, and there's no way not. It's true of every sentence you've ever read. You have to interpret it, and different interpreters will interpret different sentences differently. The New Testament is made up of sentences, <laughs> and every sentence could be interpreted in a different way. So you could interpret the New Testament text to say that Jesus is fully human, but he's not really God. You could interpret to say that Jesus is really God, but he's not really human. You could interpret to say that Jesus Christ is two beings, one divine and one human. You could interpret to say that Jesus' death uh, uh, and his resurrection brought about salvation. You can, break, you can read it to say Jesus actually never really died. You, and so you, it's a different way of reading it. 
Um, the question is, what are the more probable interpretations? But for sects, you know, sects should just go with their interpretation. So for that reason, they all have a good foundation in the New Testament. How does Luke portray an imperpetual Jesus? Say that again. How does Luke's gospel portray an imperpetual Jesus? I don't know what imperpetual means. Does that um, mean that he's not always lived, maybe? That Jesus has not always been existent? Yeah, I, I think that's... Uh, I, I remember you mentioning something like that in the book. I don't remember the exact page. I don't have it in front of me. Well, I talk about... Luke portraying Jesus as somebody who comes into existence with a virgin birth. Okay. And I also talk about Luke portraying Jesus as somebody who doesn't have a passion, uh, that he doesn't suffer. It sounds like they're asking about whether Jesus came into existence at some point, according to Luke. Um, so I'll answer that question. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, Christians traditionally... Um, since probably since the second century, I thought that Jesus, you know, he existed from before his birth, he pre existed. And since the fourth century, at least, and the majority of Christians have thought that Jesus always existed. Um, there's never a time that he did not exist. That's been the traditional view of Christianity. And so, uh, what I have, um, you know, this isn't my art, I didn't come up with this. So, you just read the text. A lot of people have noticed this when you read the Gospel of Luke. It, it, in the Gospel of Jesus comes into existence when he is conceived by Mary through the Holy Spirit. The evidence of this is in um, the uh, announcement, the Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel comes to Mary. So she's, uh, she's a young woman, not married. She's betrothed to Joseph. Uh, they've never had sex. And the angel Gabriel says, you're going to conceive a son. And Mary says, whoa, what? I, uh, I've, I've never known a man, meaning in the biblical sense, I'm, I've never had sex with a man. And the angel then replies that he says, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. The power of the Most High shall overshadow you. So the one born from you shall be called Holy, the Son of God. The reason Jesus is the son of God is because God gets Mary pregnant. He comes into existence at the point of the uh, conception. And so Luke has a virgin birth, but it does not have a pre-existence of Jesus. And that contrasts with Paul, who has a pre-existence of Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So he goes all the way back um, in eternity. Um, and then he becomes a human being and he became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. So in John, the pre-existent divine word of God, who is God, becomes a human. But there's no word of a virgin birth. So Luke has a virgin birth, but no pre-existence. Um, John has a pre-existence, but no pre-virgin birth. And what traditional Christian theology does then is it smashes the two together so that you end up with Jesus who became incarnate through the Virgin Mary. Incarnate comes from John. Virgin Mary comes from Luke. <laughs> and they're actually incommensurate, but we put them together to make them, to make them gel. What are before textual variants of the final chapters of Luke. What's going on there? The four. <laughs> well, there are dozens, actually. <laughs> so let me look, look up Luke to see which what the four are that this person probably has in mind. Is that what he says? The four textual? Well, I'm, I remember uh, I bookmarked it. I have to find it. But uh, in this somewhere way. in here, you mentioned something about four, I guess, four specific yeah, I probably mentioned yeah, more specific yes. ones. Did you have, if you tell me the references, I can tell you what they're all about. I don't think I've got a copy of the book here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, misquoting Jesus. Gospel of Mark. Oh, no. Where's Mark? Where's the index? Oh, no. Yeah, here it is. <laughs> okay. Um, it's Luke's gospel. Is that what he said? Yeah. It, yeah. Okay. Sorry. 
Uh, no, I'm sorry. I can't find. Uh, I can't uh, find the page. Yeah, I've got. I've got an index that'll tell me. So, uh, sorry. Let me just see if they are. Okay. Uh, loop. Right. Got it. Um, okay. Oh yeah, these are interesting. One, two, three, four. All right. Uh, so um, there's only um, of the, of these four. They're not all, all four are not important, but a couple of them are. So. Um, the one okay. that is, you want me to deal with the, the ones that are? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, the first of the four that are, oh, um, there's one that's kind of interesting. Oh, no, that's not very interesting. Actually, there's only one that really is a kicker um, in the last chapter of yeah, the last really the one that's a really a kicker that matters for things is John is Luke chapter twenty four verses fifty one to fifty two, um, and so oh, I'm sorry, this is sorry, this is taking. Uh, this is the one that's been written about the most, and it has to do with whether Jesus ascends to heaven when he dies, um, and so what happened after he dies. Uh, so in John, in Luke 24, it says, Jesus led them to the disciples. He's raised from the dead now. He led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was, it was carried up into heaven. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, uh, praising God. Okay, so this last bit where he says, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Those words, and was carried up, up to heaven, are not found in a key witness of, uh, of the gospel of, of uh, uh, in the gospel of Luke. Um, some scholars have suspected that, in fact, it is an addition to the text. It's not found in two of our earliest witnesses, Codex Sinaiticus and uh, Codex Bize, the, the one I was mentioning earlier. It's not found in some Latin witnesses and it's not found in one of the Syriac manuscripts. And so it's a change that would have been made very early on in the history of Christianity that he was carried up into heaven. And the reason it matters is because if you read Luke 24, this is happening on the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. If you just start with chapter 24 and you start at the beginning, it's on the day of the resurrection and everything that happens is dated after that. And then immediately they did in this. And when the sun went down, they went this. And while Jesus was still talking to them, they did this. It's like, what? It's happening on the same day. And then he's taken up to heaven. The reason that's an issue is because he's also taken up to heaven in Acts chapter 1, written by the same guy, written by Luke. And in Acts chapter 1, what happens is Jesus doesn't go up to heaven the day of his resurrection, it's 40 days later. 40, he spends 40 days with the disciples, proving that he's been raised from the dead. And then after 40 days, um, he gives them, gives them his last instructions and they watch him physically ascend to heaven. And, uh, okay, so how's that work? I mean, does it happen the day of his resurrection or does it happen 40 years later, 40, 40 days later, 40 days later? It depends which of these books you read. And they're both written by the same person, the same author. And so, so the textual variant in chapter 24, verse 51 is really complicated because you could, you could argue different things. You could say that Luke originally had this in his gospel to Luke that he was taken up to heaven, and he had it at the beginning of Acts, that he went up 40 days later, and the scribe, realizing the contradiction, took it out of Luke. He omitted it. That omission, the smaller, the shorter text, without that line, is found in most of our manuscripts, including our best manuscripts, our be earliest best manuscripts. Um, so maybe the scribe took it out. Uh, but it's in there in most manuscripts. And so maybe the scribe put it in. That's your choice. I took it out or a scribe put it in. But why would a scribe put it in? 
you can see why you take it out, but why do we do that? And I actually make an argument in my book, Orthodox Corruption of Scripture. I, I refer to it in my book, Misquoting Jesus. But my argument in the Orthodox Corruption of Scripture is that, that um, a scribe put it in. Put it in because it shows that Jesus was physically taken up to heaven. That matters because many, uh, we know of Gnostic groups and other groups that were using, we know of people who didn't believe Jesus was fully human, who used the Gospel of Luke. And so scribes throughout the Gospel of Luke were adding things to make it show that Jesus really was a tangible material being, not just a spiritual being. And I argue in my book that this, that's what happens here, is that the scribe is uh, adding it here, and that Luke's not an idiot who like forgets that he's just said that he you know ascended 40 days earlier. In fact, he didn't say that. That's it's a it's a scribal addition, is what I argue. When do you think that, that addition to the text was made? Well, it's um it's in um as I said, it's in so it's in of our one of our best fourth century manuscripts, Sinaiticus. It's in a fifth century manuscript, Codex D, which is very interesting. It's in both the Syriac and the uh, Latin, in Syriac and Latin manuscripts. Normally, that combination of witnesses, if you've got that particular combination of witnesses of Syriac, Latin, Codex D, and even if you have Sinaiticus, it's usually thought that that's a, that's a, um, a change that's been made in the second century. So it could have been made early. It could have been made you know, within 50 years of, of Luke's gospel. And then my closing question, is the Gospel of John really independent of the synoptics? And I, I know that's a thing that's still being debated, but I also know a lot of scholars still think that John is either largely or totally independent of the synoptics. It's a very difficult question. Um, the way I'll get to it is by pointing out what I said earlier, that the reason that we know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, have copying going on is because you have lots of the same stories, often in the same sequence, and almost usually in the same sequence, and often actually word for word the same. That's what you do not get with the Gospel of John in relationship to the synoptics. Um, if you look at the ministry of Jesus in chapters 1 through 11, John has uh, not entirely different stories, but almost entirely different stories. All of his speeches in John, he gives lengthy speeches. None of them are found in the synoptics. None of the synoptic sayings of Jesus are found in John. Um, the, um, the activities are largely different. There are some similarity. There are similarities. He heals the sick and he, you know, and he raises the dead. But the stories themselves are almost entirely different, except for a couple of exceptions. You know, he, he feeds the multitudes with uh, loaves, and, loaves and fishes, and he walks on water. That's similar. But the stories themselves aren't similar at all. Like when you read those stories, they're not, they're not word for word similarities. You start getting more uh, similarities once Jesus goes to Jerusalem during the Passover, during the yeah you know, for the Passover feast, and so the Passion narrative has more similar stories. You have, you know, you have uh, Jesus going into Jerusalem, and you have him uh, teaching there, and you have him finding opposition there, and you have him being betrayed by Judas. And he has a last meal and betrayed by Judas, and and appears before Jewish authorities and goes handed over to Pilate. So the basic storyline is is similar in many ways. The details are different up and down the line, very different. So the question is, did John know the synoptics? When I was in graduate school in the 70s and 80s, th there was a consensus that virtually everybody agreed John did not know the synoptics. That was just standard, the standard line. That has shifted in recent years as scholarship always shifts on old texts where you don't have a lot more text to talk about. <laughs> so you disagree with what people said in the previous generation, so you can publish your book. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they were all wrong. And so now the pendulum's scripting the other way where a lot of people are saying John didn't know the synoptics. That would not mean that John copied the synoptics because he didn't. There, there, he wouldn't have copied the synoptics. The argument is that there are sufficient broad similarities 
And that if you look in some details, there are things that make you think, even though he's not copying it, he seems to have known their stories uh, that make people think John probably uh, did know the synoptics. So my colleague I mentioned before, Hugo Mendez, thinks this, and he's he's not alone. This is this seems to be the way the field is moving. As a dinosaur in the field, I'm not moving with it. <laughs> I I have a higher threshold of proof from a lot of my colleagues who do this kind of thing. I think that if you have two authors who are talking about a similar topic, if they don't have word for word agreements, you don't know that one is used to the other. Um, in modern, in the modern day, if somebody, um, you know, if, if, if somebody writes a book about, um, you know, the, the manuscripts of the New Testament and says the kinds of things that I've just said on this, on, on our interview here, I've said some things about the manuscripts of the New Testament, and they say similar things. There'd be no reason to think this person has heard this interview or has read my books because the kind of things you're talking about are things we all talk about. We talk about the manuscripts, it's just the things we talk about. We've all, you know, and so if though the person starts using language precisely like I use, uh, you know, uh, where I say things like, we, we don't have the original, we have copies of the copies of the copies of the copies. And I, you know, that's kind of a thing I say a lot. Where I say things like, there are more differences in our manuscripts than there are words in the New Testament. You know, I, these are things that I say. And um, I, don't, I don't normally hear other people, I, that, that, la that last line, by the way, that last line, that there are more words than, than copy, there are more copies, there are more differences in our copies than words in the New Testament. That's a line that I got from Bruce Metzger. A lot of people get angry with me for using that line. Metzger used to say it all the time. He was my teacher and everybody adores him. It's especially the conservative critics who criticize me for using the, saying it, <laughs> but I got it from Metzger. So, so that, that would be an example of something where you could show, well, I got it from someone else because he said it before me and I say exactly the same thing. And if somebody else says the same things, then, you know, they're getting, probably getting it from me because I don't think Metzger ever wrote it. He, he may have written it. Um, so, uh, so I look for verbatim agreements and you don't get those. The other side though, that John did know the synoptics has a very good argument. The best argument is that this kind of writing, a gospel um, that um, goes at least from the baptism of Jesus to his resurrection uh, and is designed to tell stories about Jesus, narratives to show that he's the son of God, sayings to show that he's the son of God, uh, and, that, and that they have similar stories about the passion. And that it would be really hard to imagine that two people independently came up with that idea of writing a book like that. And that's the strongest argument that John knew the synoptics because it's unlikely that he independently would have come up with the same genre. Uh, so I get that. It's a strong argument, uh, but it's not strong enough for me. The reason it's not strong enough for me is because people were telling stories about Jesus, the same stories, year after year after year. And the big point was always that he went to Jerusalem and probably the sequence of things, you know, oh, he had this triumphal entry and that, you know, and he he went to the temple and he and he roused the authorities ire and that he got turned over to the Sanhedrin by Judas. And, you know, th those things would naturally fall into a sequence. And I think they did fall into a sequence, even outside of the Gospels. Um, and so the idea that you would have somebody write down what's happening in the oral tradition all over the place doesn't seem to me to require that John knew the synoptics. The other thing that's really important to me, sorry, I'm going on about this, but I'll, I'll end with this, is I think a lot of my colleagues are too much oriented toward modern views of writing. We are literary people as scholars. We always think in terms of books. And in the ancient world, most people did not think in terms of books. We think so much in terms of books that if we have two books, all we can do is try to imagine who borrowed from whom. Or if we have like, we have a story in one thing that sounds vaguely like a story in another, then we say, oh, actually he got it from Plato. 
Or if Mark sounds like has something that's kind of like Homer, oh, he got it from Homer, or she got it. From, like you make all you can you connect all the dots. But the thing is, we don't have most of the dots. There were hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people telling stories about Jesus. There, were, you know, how how many documents were surviving from early Christianity? I don't know how many Gospels were written. Luke said a lot. Maybe John knew one of these other Gospels. I don't know what he knew, but but he, he doesn't indicate that he had these sources, and I did. I don't. I don't think he did. I don't think the evidence is good enough. So I think it's independent. Well, thank you for joining me today, uh, Professor Ehrman, and I thank uh, um, everybody for their super chats and their super chat questions. I really appreciate it. They were great questions, and I'll see everybody later. Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. Hello viewers, thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during a live stream. Thank you.